First things first, this guy, Alex Martinier, my super postdoc, has now abandoned me. He's gone to Montpellier. I've heard the word Montpellier a lot today. Have you guys noticed that? I don't know what's going on there, but they've snapped him up, and I'm going to miss him a great deal. Most of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is Alex's research. This here is a model that's on a poster outside, and this is my jumping off point for the bit of the talk that I'm going to carry on. I'm interested in studying proteins, that's a protein there, in the plasma membrane, and I look at the way that they associate and move laterally within the membrane sheet. So in this model, we have a protein, and this is Foreman 1 of Arabidopsis, which we have discovered is anchored both to the cell wall and to the actin cytoskeleton. And that got us interested in plasma membrane proteins in general and their dynamics. In this case, it's very obvious why this protein doesn't seem to move very much. It's anchored at both ends. But that's not the case for all proteins. So, you've seen this slide about four times already during various other people's talks, but uh, a, a quickie then about the protein structure of the plasma membrane. Proteins are inserted in the plasma membrane in all sorts of different ways. You won't be able to read this stuff here. The germane or the salient point is that we have proteins with transmembrane domains and we have proteins that are peripherally associated with membranes. And we decided that if we were going to look at protein mobility within the plasma membrane that we should look at all sorts of different proteins, and that's what I'm going to report on. And the technique that we use is either photoactivation or photobleaching based, and it's designed to measure the diffusion rate of proteins within this sheet. And just as a, just as a curiosity, proteins that are in liquid media or something the equivalent of outside of the cell will move with an average of 87 micrometers squared per second. In the cytosol, things are a little bit more dense and proteins slow rate right down, but within the bilayer of the plasma membrane, proteins slow rate right down again, not 0.5 to not 0.03 micrometers squared per second. So that's the sort of time scale that we're working with here. Now, let's get on to the technique. I'm, I'm surprised that nobody today has talked about FRAP at all. The last meeting I went to, everything was FRAP, FRAP, FRAP. It was hilarious. By the time I got up to talk about FRAP, there was no need to introduce it at all. But just for those of you that might not have done this, let's see if I can get the movie going. That's a sheet of membrane made fluorescent with a membrane protein fusion to GFP or some other fluorescent protein. If I can get this plane again, watch for the moment of bleaching. So we target a laser and we bleach a small area and over the course of the next few seconds, the bleached area fills back in with protein. And that protein in this case, because of the shortness of the time scale, is coming from areas of the plasma membrane that haven't been bleached. So that's a convenient protein. What we do is we measure the mean fluorescence intensity within the bleached region, which was the black circle there, and we plot it this way and fit a curve to it. And you can see then that proteins recover with a characteristic mobile fraction, and we can measure a half time of fluorescence recovery. Um, and, and the time course of most of the work that I'm going to talk about here this afternoon is one to two minutes, something like that. So um, mobile fraction, in other words, how much of the black circle fills back in with protein over the course of the measurement and half time, how fast does the protein move? And those two numbers can be put into an equation for diffusion rate. And it's the diffusion rate that I'm going to be talking about for all of the proteins from here on in. So if you're going to investigate plasma membrane proteins, the best approach we reckoned was to look at Proteins that are inserted in all sorts of different ways. So we have things with single transmembrane domains, and we have several different ones of these. We have things with multiple transmembrane domains, and you'll notice that some of these have extracellular domains that are quite large, and others have intracellular domains that are quite large. The little green star represents the location of the fluorescent protein in each case. And you'll see that we have some proteins that were chosen because they are associated with the membrane in ways that don't involve transmembrane domains. So these are the kind of curves that I introduced to you a minute ago. This represents the mobility of the protein. The higher the curve gets, 
the more the protein is recovering after being bleached. And in this example here, we have a protein called AGP4, which is bleached, and one minute later, we can still see the bleached circle, suggesting that the protein doesn't move very fast. GPA1, GFP, on the other hand, over the same 60 seconds, fills back in. So we discovered, firstly, that we've got all sorts of different mobilities for plasma membrane proteins. Some of them flatline completely. That's where AGP4 comes in, and that will sit there for 30 minutes. I'm not kidding. That black circle stays there. The thing is really immobilized somehow. Other ones, like LTI6B and GPA1, move fairly quickly. So we thought this was interesting, and right away we decided that we better try a couple of proteins under their native promoters in Arabidopsis just to make sure that the non or the lack of movement in the membrane wasn't just a question of protein overcrowding within the membrane. If you're doing things with overexpression, overcrowding could be a problem. So under native promoters we found that the ones that didn't move still didn't move basically. So that got that out of the way right away. So there's a huge difference, an order of magnitude difference at least, between the fastest and slowest. What's causing the difference in speed between fastest and slowest? The first thing we thought, well, I don't know, we thought of several things simultaneously, but the first thing I'm going to describe is the idea of protein association. We all think about proteins as forming signaling complexes or transporter complex or lipid rafts and things like that within membranes. Are proteins that are immobilized within the plasma membrane slow because they're associating with other proteins? The way to test that is to make what I call a minimal set of proteins. And these are proteins that have the, 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 the membrane binding information attached to a GFP, but nothing else. So these things don't have the domains now that will let them interact with other things. Okay, so we have uh, mirostolated GFP, prenylated PI, GFP, GPI, and a single transmembrane domain. So five different minimal proteins that all target the plasma membrane properly and that still exhibit a range of different movement characteristics within the membrane. YFP, PI moves fairly quickly while GFP, GPI doesn't move very quickly at all. So it's not protein-protein association that's causing GFP, GPI to remain immobilized within the membrane. So what else might it be? In animal cells, Aki Kasumi came up with this hop diffusion model where he showed that proteins within the membrane bilayer are actually immobilized because of a fence or a corral system made by the actin cytoskeleton. So we thought, well, I mean, I thought to the point where I proposed a grant and actually got the funding to study the immobilization of proteins caused by the actin cytoskeleton. I was very disappointed when my same super postdoc guy came in and said, well, I got rid of the actin cytoskeleton and there's no change in the way the proteins move or don't move. So um, th that was the thing we were studying at that point. And as I say, when you use drug treatments to get rid of the actin cytoskeleton or the microtubule cytoskeleton, there's really not very much change in the movement. And these bars here are the same as the curves. They're just representing the rate of movement of the proteins in the membrane. So if they move fast before, they continue to move fast, or in fact, a little bit more slowly even, once the actin cytoskeleton is dissolved away. So, at, in any case, the rate of diffusion of these proteins wasn't increased when the actin cytoskeleton or the microtubule cytoskeleton was depolymerized. So, we moved on to study something else. And, I, I mean, this represents a lot of work, but time constraints say that I'm just going to do this in 15 seconds or something like that. We investigated association of proteins into lipid rafts, and we did that by looking at raft fractions and non-raft fractions, and we found no correlation. Some proteins that are in raft fractions seem to move relatively quickly compared to some proteins that are out of raft fractions and vice versa. So being in a raft or being out of a raft doesn't necessarily correlate with the way that you move as a membrane protein. We used turf microscopy to look with slightly higher resolution at the complexes that these proteins form in membranes, and we found the same conclusion. The, the, the size and distribution of the complexes that we can see by turf don't correlate with the way that the proteins move within the membranes. And, and again, same postdoc down in Montpellier emails me this morning 
and says, oh, he's analyzed the results. Now we're looking at it at higher resolution, single molecule level using a photo activation technique. And he says in his email, the results are fantastic. But he didn't tell me what they were, so I don't know and I can't report. I'm so excited. I can't wait. I'm sure, I'm sure I believe him. Maybe he's just winding me up. Um, so anyway, we disrupted rafts and we disrupted membrane sterile structure with Philippin treatment. And again, as you can see, there was no real change at all to the way these proteins move around. So we've investigated cytoskeleton corralling and protein associations and lipid rafts and what else might affect the way proteins move around in membranes. The title of my talk, if you think back, kind of gives it away, the cell wall. So we thought, we've got we've to start looking at the cell wall, the whole extracellular matrix, to see if that has an effect on plasma membrane protein diffusion. This is going back to the poster story a little bit, but I just wanted to show you a series of experiments that we did to look at the cell wall. So this is just an example, again, of the technique. You make protoplasts by using enzymes to get rid of the pectin and the cellulose that make up the primary cell wall. And you can stain the cell wall. So this beautiful image here is the cell wall of a protoplast at time zero. Nothing there. We've used uh, calcifloor white to stain the cell wall after 24 hours and after 48 hours, and you can see that it grows back over the 48-hour period. Now, do you remember that immobilized protein we talked about, GPI? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. This is the Foreman story from the poster outside. Foreman that's been manufactured so that it doesn't interact with the actin cytoskeleton doesn't have a cell wall to bind to at time zero and moves very quickly but over the 48 hours, slows right, right down. And that was our proof that it's interacting and binding with the cell wall. So we decided to use the same technique of making protoplast to look at all of the other proteins in our minimal protein set. Uh, we also use plasmolysis. And I, I don't know, for some of you that might not be familiar with plasmolysis, that just means that you treat the cells with an osmotic medium so that the protoplast, the cell membrane itself, is shrunken away from the cell wall. If proteins in the plasma membrane had been interacting with the cell wall, they would no longer be able to interact with the cell wall once plasmolysis takes effect. And this was GFP, GPI, and, and in fact, GFP with the trans, single transmembrane domain. And in both cases, in control, before the cells were plasmalized, we would bleach and after two minutes, there would be very little, if any, recovery of the fluorescence into the bleach spot. But as soon as we plasmalize cells, bleach, wait two minutes, the fluorescence recovery is very, very high. And you can see that it's significant in both cases. So we've got a huge recovery, lots more protein mobility as soon as the cell wall isn't in the equation anymore. Protoplast experiments then, this, these two pictures here just show the protoplast in green, the red is just chlorophyll autofluorescence. So I apologize for that, Mike. Um, the green is the cell wall growing back over 48 hours just as a control. GFP, GPI, time zero, bleach, and recovery after 100 seconds. That's without the cell wall. With the cell wall, after 48 hours, bleach, no recovery. So we really, really clearly see strong indication that the cell wall is affecting the lateral dynamics of GPI. And you can see that here indicated on this, on this graph as well. It's the very same thing. The green line here is at time zero, and the dotted line is at time 48 hours. Interestingly, there were a whole set of proteins that we did. You remember all the ones that I showed you back at the start. A lot of them weren't affected as much. This one here, MAP-GFP, the mir mir who can say that? Meristillated protein. I can usually say that. I don't know why. It, it slows down a little bit in its half time, in its rate of recovery, but it still recovers completely. So the cell wall has a little effect on it, but a huge effect on GPI. We also, and I know I'm going to run out of time in a second, we also tried to disrupt cell wall development using isoxabin treatment, and we created an artificial cell wall by at time zero embedding the protoplast in agar. And both of those treatments meant that the proteins were more mobile than at time 48 when the cell wall was intact. So at time zero, here's time zero here as a control, 
Here's time zero when protoplasts are embedded in agar. Agar actually has almost the same effect as the intact cell wall does on the movement of proteins within the plasma membrane. So the one thing that might not be absolutely clear to you because I'm rushing a little bit here is that I'm talking about some proteins slowing down very dramatically when the cell wall is intact and other ones not seeming to be affected when the cell wall is removed that much. It turns out that these ones here with the extracellular domains are the ones that are affected most by the presence of the cell wall. And these ones down here that only have intracellular domains don't really seem too disturbed by whether the cell wall is there or not. But curiously, they are a little bit affected in their rates of movement. And there's a lot more to that story than what I'm letting on. But that's the take home message from my talk. Extracellular domains are interacting with the cell wall. So conclusions. Plasma membrane proteins diffuse at different rates. The cytoskeleton does not seem to corral proteins as in animal cells, and I guess that's a finding from my research because I had set out to determine just exactly how actin cytoskeleton corrals worked in plant cells. Turns out they don't. Um, but the cell wall plays a significant role in stabilizing plasma membrane protein kinetics, particularly for those proteins with extracellular domains. And the last one is just more of a comment. I'm, I'm now thinking about the next phase of the research, and all I can say at this point for all you people that have been listening to all these wonderful talks today, plasma membrane proteins formed into signaling complex and transport complexes and pores and things like that are, are all important, and it's also important in cell wall production for people that have been looking at SES A complex movement and things like that. So we will continue on looking at this. I've got a lot of people that I want to thank. Some of these people we're just peripherally associated with this research, but they're also working with me on other aspects of plasma membrane protein development. These guys at Bordeaux are the ones that did all of the, the raft fraction, raft, non-raft sort of stuff for me, so I'd really like to thank them. Those are my turf microscopy experts over at Rutherford Appleton. Thank you.